Okay, so as we mentioned at the beginning of the class today, as 3D modelers, we always have to be modeling, okay? This is an experience-based art form, it really is. Not only are we learning a really radical tool set, but we're also learning a really radical way of thinking too, right? Making things in 2D in comparison is wicked easy, right? Because in every sense, it's a what you see is what you get environment. There's very little technology that gets in, in, gets in the way. In our world, we are fundamentally creating these digital sculptors. And how we create our mesh, okay, the sequence that we go through to, uh, to create our geometry is going to influence what we're going to get and what we're able to do in the future. So practice, 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 okay? We want to always be looking at ways that we can use these simple tools because the tools are relatively simple, right? It's our construction sequence that is the part that's complex, okay? Today we're going to spend our time really looking at the lighting and rendering side of working inside of Maya, okay? And this is a weird, wacky environment. It's complex. It's not easy at all, right? So I want to spend some time. You know, I don't want you guys to miss this, so can we save that for later? This is a, a deep, deep dive today. So to kind of draw focus to what we're talking about, um, in the week four module on Canvas, I've already started posting all the things that we're going to be doing this week. And specifically, you have two missions, the good old desktop scene. We'll come back and talk about that here in a minute. And then the marker scene, which we're going to be working on during our lab today. So you're not going to be doing any modeling this week for your homework. You're welcome, right? <laughs> uh, this week is going to be all about materials and textures and understanding how the rendering engine is wholly responsible for creating the pictures that we're going to be submitting uh, for all of our assignments and the artwork that we're going to create. Okay? If you rewind a couple weeks, I said as 3D modelers, we have to have a lot of different hats and our hats change pretty quickly. Some days we put the construction worker hat on and we're physically building you know, cities and sculptures. Other days, you know, we had put the photographer hat on and look at composition and framing and lighting. Today, we're going to put on our texturing hat and look at how the light is interacting with our surfaces and how we can use these material characteristics to change our audience's understanding of what these objects are made out of. Okay? Our conversation today is going to revolve around materials inside of Maya, which are responsible for determining how the light is going to interact with the surface, okay? Because really, when you take a step back and look at materials, it's all about our perception of material, right? It's all about our perception and understanding how the light rays are interacting with these polygons that are producing the illusion of wood or the illusion of metal, okay? So we're going to be looking at that very directly, and, I, and I've provided you for your homework and lab assignment today some really fun project files that will allow you to jump in and start working on this. So we're going to be doing the marker scene here in about, I don't know, maybe an hour. And then for our homework this week, we're going to have the desktop scene. And, and the, the banner image on, this, uh, on, the, on the assignment sheet is really representative of, of the mission itself. I'm giving you guys literally a blank canvas, okay? And you need to apply materials and textures to everything. So you're going to fill in, you're going to colorize this entire scene with your own materials and textures that you create to create whatever it is that you, whatever vision of this room that you, you think it's going to be. We'll come back and talk about the desktop scene here in a second. But let's begin our exploration of materials and textures quite simply by running over into Maya. And uh, I'm going to go into my poly modeling shelf. And let's do this. I'm going to start off, I'm going to build a simple little scene which will allow us to very, very quickly start to uh, explore and understand how we can work with some materials and some extra lighting features to give us some good renders, okay? So I'm going to start off, and I hope that you follow along. Everything that I'm going to be doing now is something that you can build with the tools that are in front of you. I want to make a ground plane. There it is. And I'm going to turn off the grid, too. This top row of our viewports is going to become a little bit more important today, okay? Uh, so this is the button that turns off our grid. Bye bye grid. Let's just make this a really big plane by scaling it up. In addition, let's also populate this entire scene with a couple other objects so we can start playing with how all these materials work. Uh, let's start off with a cube. Okay. You can already see that the size of my cube in relationship to the size of the plane is not what I want. So let's uh, look at how... Turn on my grid again. There we go. I want to move this cube up. So it's sitting on top of the plane, that's good enough for me. It's not perfect, but you know what? No one's perfect. Let's make a sphere in there as well. 
Why not? Let's just do it. Let's pick a cylinder. Make the cylinder a little bit bigger. That's okay. And can't not have a donut. Here, I'll do this. I'll even tip the donut up so it looks like it's kind of leaning up against the wall of my little big. There we go. Gotta have the donut. I love donuts, by the way. Oh my gosh, it's gotta be Krispy Kreme. Oh, I couldn't even pick. I'm a big fan of the Boston cream donuts because it's got everything that I need. <laughs> it would not improve your grade at all, but uh, you definitely give a high, get a high five from me. No, I'm not allowed to uh, accept uh, gifts or bribes in any way, so sorry. Yeah, and the, the, the natural follow-up question is, yes, people have tried. <laughs> uh, it's amazing what people do to get an A. It really is. Here's a donut. Can I have an A now? No, you didn't do a single homework assignment. I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> All right, so before we can really start talking about materials, we have to put some lights into our scene. And we've been playing around with Arnold a lot over the past couple weeks, okay? And let's just fire open the Arnold preview engine. All right. And as one might imagine, poof. Nothingness, right? It's completely black because there's not a light in our scene. Now, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking a lot about area lights, which are really great. And we're going to continue to throw a lot of love at area lights, okay? They are great. But I want to introduce a new type of light for you guys today. And it's called, uh, I don't want to be specific. I almost called it the wrong thing. Sky Dome. This one. Sorry. This one right here. This is the skylight, the Sky Dome. Let's do it real fast. And there's the Sky Dome. And what happens here, let's talk about the specifics. Because what's going on is that in the background of our scene, okay, the background of our scene, you see how we, it's added in this gigantic sphere, okay? If you will, our entire world lives in this sphere. This sphere is emitting a whole series of lights, a whole, whole series of light rays into our environment, right? And the color of those light rays is directly tied to the properties of our, of our sky dome, right? Now, I have my sky dome selected in my outliner. And then over in my attribute editor, the first thing we have is color, okay? Default color is white. Let me uh, bring open my preview window again. Now, watch what happens to my preview, the background color of my scene here, when I change the color. Boop, it tints everything, okay? Let's put it back to white, and I'm just going to make it ever so slightly yellow because there's no such thing as a pure white light inside of our universe. Everything are shades of yellow and blue, right? It's physically impossible to have a white light. Physically impossible, okay? Um, all of our light colors are yellows and blues, okay? So it's a good practice to kind of get into. Um, so now with uh, the sky dome in the background, what we're providing here, or what we're producing here, is called global illumination. This inside of this beach ball is firing off a whole bunch of light rays into our environment. And the colors of those light rays are interacting with the polygons in our scene. And it's tinting and illuminating those shapes, right? So now we have this kind of this huge blanket of light that's indirectly illuminating all the objects in our scene. So these sky domes are awesome. Because now, instead of having an area light in this infinite black void like we had before, now we have this wonderful white background that's indirectly and softly illuminating all the surfaces in our, in our scene, which is pretty neat. Okay, um, here's another great little trick that we haven't talked about. Of course, I have my cursor over here, and as, as I start to navigate around, okay, you can see pretty quickly that the Arnold preview window is going to update. Well, here's kind of a winner, and I really like this one, okay? If you go into the window, pull down menu, inside the Arnold preview win uh, window, we have this 3D manipulation option. This is the default is to turn, is checked off. Check this out. If I turn it on, now I'm in this window here. I can use my exact same viewport navigation controls and start to orbit and navigate around 
and uh, start to produce some really cool pictures. Okay, it's a really handy dandy way of working. It doesn't, it, it, you know, if it stops us from having to have our cursor over in the viewport, and now we can have the exact same effect here inside uh, inside of this window. Okay, all right. That's going to do me. I'm pretty happy with uh, the composition of my shot at the moment. And now we're going to start talking about materials. Yeah. Yeah, so it's in the window pull down menu in the Arnold render view. And it's 3D manipulation. That's the one that you want to turn on. Okay. All right. So we're going to be hanging out in this preview window for a big chunk of the day today. Because in every sense, our conversation about lights materials and textures is, is directly tied to the render engine, right? So let's go in and start looking at how we can create materials and the effects of all the channels inside of our system itself. Since we're going to be using the Arnold rendering engine, we want to make sure that we're creating Arnold specific materials, okay? The hypershade, as we've explored before, is really the area, this little button here, is really the home, the area for us to create and manage, manipulate all of our materials, okay? Admittedly, this can be an intimidating environment. There's a lot going on, okay? A lot going on. And there's, there's a lot of buttons and a lot of bells and whistles, and it kind of, in every sense, exposes the professional nature of this application, okay? Remember, this isn't made for beginners. Maya is made for advanced super users, okay? And Industrial Light and Magic and Pixar, I mean, they're all using Maya to do their work, okay? So it's built for super pros and for super nerds, okay? But we're going get to get to know it pretty well and start working with the basics, okay? Now, I want to have a whole series of materials that allow me to colorize each of my objects in my scene separately from each other. Maybe I want the cube to be red and the cylinder to be green or something like that, right? It's really easy for us to do this, and the hypershade is going to be the first place that we want to go to start creating these materials, okay? Um, it's the most comfortable creation environment. It really is. Uh, so here, let's check it out. Creating materials in the Hypershade is easy. If you look at the way it's broken up, we have an entire section down here called Create. And it brings to the surface all of the pre-built and exposed materials and shaders and lights and utilities that come with Maya. And there are a bunch of them, right? There are so many that it, this list on the, on the right here becomes an overwhelming environment for us. So here's what I would recommend that you do. Just memorize a couple different things to help you search and very quickly sort the list for the thing that we're looking for, okay? Now for us, we need to use the Arnold stuff. This is the, the default Maya stuff, which has its function and its role. We'll come back to that here in a minute. But for, for, for today, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use the Arnold stuff. And specifically, what we're gonna be doing is the AI standard surface shader. Okay, that's the material that we want to create. Now, you certainly could go into the Arnold section, click Shader, or in the search field, and this is how I do it, because I want to go, I want to do it fast. I just do AIS, okay, which is going to search for AI, you know, anything that begins with AIS. And there it is, AI Standard Surface Shader. Now, before you start double-clicking away here, okay, in this world, just a single left click is going to create a new material a double click is going to create two of them, so be careful. <laughs> Just single left click on, on the list, and a new AI surface shader is created up here in our browser. So the browser, as one might imagine, is where we're going to manage all the different materials inside of our scene. We have four at the moment, but as we get into uh, our homework this week, and then we have a really great lab assignment next week, you may have 50 or 60 of these things going on. So the, the, the browser is a, a way for us to very quickly manage all these materials. The first thing that I'm going to do, now that we're starting to work with our own custom materials here, is give it a name. So I have my AI standard surface material selected, and then over here, in this cool little material viewer, and of course downstairs in the property editor, let's give it a unique name, something that's going to separate this material from the rest of the pack, okay? So I think I'm just going to call this one very simply red, okay? Now I've hit the return key, and, uh, and now it's called red. We're going to talk a lot about all of this stuff here in a minute, but for, for giggles, let's just make this the color value red as well. Okay. Now we have a big time update issue on the Mac. And when I mean a big time update, I mean it is massive, right? 
Uh, so don't expect to see the little thing pop in immediately. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It's happening on my, on my computer as well. Yeah, Windows. it's a big time update issue. But, I, and I, this is my least favorite thing to say, trust me, the color value has been changed, okay? Let's apply that color value now, okay? Or that material to one of the objects inside of our scene. Now there's a couple different ways that we can apply materials to different objects inside of our three-dimensional scene. Now I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do this to my cube. Uh, naturally, you can right click and hold. And at the bottom of this list, let's see if I can do it. See it says assign new material, nope. Assign existing material, that's what I'm talking about. This is going to show you all the materials that are currently in your browser in the hypershade. And there's good old red. And then the moment I mouse up, voila, now that red material has been applied to my cube. Okay. Let's go back to the hypershade for a second and make another one. Now it's updated, my red guy, which is nice. Okay. Let's do AIS. Standard surface, single left click, and let's give it a good name. Let's call this one green. Okay, now, and I'll also I'm going to change the color to green. Now, in addition, there's, there's also another way for us to very quickly apply these materials to the objects inside of our scene. We don't have to use that right-click menu, and I kind of hate that right-click menu because it's super long, right? And if your object, you know, um, Joseph and I were kind of battling this earlier, right? Check it out. If I wanted to apply my green material to this thing at the bottom of my screen, if I right-click, on his machine, this little popover menu was getting cut off by the bottom of our application frame. That's no bueno, right? This right-click menu is a problem. It's a big-time problem. So I like to try to avoid it as much as I can. I like to use my hypershade and interactively apply the material from this view by middle mouse clicking. Middle mouse clicking and dragging it on top of an object. Okay? It's the middle mouse button. This is another reason why we have to have a middle mouse click. We have to have that three button mouse. The middle mouse button will allow us to left click and drag a material to an object. Okay. All right. Let's make uh, a couple more here. Now let's make one that's blue. All right. Now in addition to doing object level association with the material, we can also do component level. Maybe I only want to have certain faces on my, uh, on my donut, for example, be blue or yellow for that matter, okay? Let's just do it real fast. It's pretty easy. So now I'm going to hit the F11 key. Oops, sorry. That's my fault. Uh, let me fix that real fast. F11 is currently paired to, um, all right, I got to remember where it is. Where is it? Here we go. It's not. Right now, show desktop is paired to F11. So now, yay, now I'm in there. I'm working now. OK, great. Because F11 is the keyboard shortcut to get faces, right? So what if I want to have like every other row here? OK. Be blue. Okay, why not, right? Okay, we can do the exact same thing, of course, you know. Um, sometimes you, you get some weird results if you try to middle mouse. Yep, it worked. Oh, I didn't change the color, excuse me. There we go. You can see it updates behind. Ah, uh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, but it didn't do it on the selected ones. Did you guys notice that? Yeah, I did the unselected ones, which is kind of weird, right? That's not exactly what I'm after. Uh, let me hit undo, go back in time a couple steps. That way we don't have the blue material paired. Now it's still linked. Right, let's do Lambert. Here we go. Now it should be okay. There we go. All right. I lost my selection. Ah. Bear with me for a second. All right, so there's one other way that we can apply materials to the selected component, right? 
you can try middle mouse button. Of course, you get the right click menu. That works too. Assign existing material blue. That works. Okay. But there's one other option that we have over here in our hypershade. And I dropped my selection. You can also right click on, on the shader ball. Okay. Assign material to selection. Okay. So you got a couple different ways of applying materials to the objects into your scene. You can middle mouse click and drag from the browser onto the object. You can use that right click menu, or you can just right click on the material in the browser itself and choose the assign, the assign option from there. So you got a whole lot of choices to make an association between an object or component pieces, polygons, and its respective material itself. Okay. All right. Now the great thing about working inside the Hypershade is that all of these materials are live. So in, in, in earnest, what I could do here, um, instead of having those stripes on my donut be blue, I could make them yellow. Oops, I'm sorry, I blocked it. I could make them yellow. And it's going to update. Of course, right now, because of my vicious bug, but let's open up Preview, and they're yellow. Okay. All right. So lots of different ways of working uh, with the materials inside of our Hypershade. Okay. Don't trust the viewport. Always trust the render. Because you can see that right now those polygons are blue. Uh, once I close, officially close Hypershade and I think close the render window, I think they're just minimized. Uh, it will update here in a minute. But point being, Yeah, it's not doing that for me, but that's okay. I'm okay. I've made peace with it. Okay. Uh, let's go back into the Hypershade for a second. Everything will update. There it is. It updated finally. Um, pop quiz. Which of these materials inside of my scene um, is the default material? Lambert. Lambert 1. Good old Lambert 1. That's the default material. Everything should be assigned upon creation to Lambert 1. Okay. Now, if you don't have Lambert 1 and you were to create a new polygonal shape, watch what happens. I'm just going to select it, hit the backspace key. Oops. Let's try that again. All right. Oh, it doesn't want it to delete it because this is a, yeah, it's a non-deletable node because it's the default one. But in other situations, you can delete it. Um, if you don't have that on there, right? Uh, Sometimes you'll get uh, some green or pink polygons inside our scene. Joe ran into this earlier, right? He created a shape, he did some extrusions, and then all of a sudden the faces of that uh, on that shape went green, like a bright green, right? That was an, those polygons were unassigned to a material. Reassigning those polygons back to materials made them shaded immediately. So that happens from time to time when things get out of sync. Okay, let's go, and I'm just going to create um, a couple more here. Yep. Um, I'm trying to assign like colors to, you know, start a little bit of the marker scene. And I have a skylight, but none of the colors are showing up in the render preview. But I am using the on old stuff. Great. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I I can't I can't work about marker lab right or think about marker lab right now. Well I'm I mean, uh, I have a skylight, my colors aren't showing up. Is it a skylight thing or is it I don't know. Okay. Without looking at the details of it, it's hard. It. It's impossible for me to know. Um, all right. Uh, so let's do, let's do this. I want my blue guy, which is not blue anymore. It's actually yellow. So let's rename it yellow. There we go. And this new one that I created, I'm going to call it blue. And of course, we'll change its surface color to blue. And I'm going to middle mouse click and drag it on top of my sphere. And we'll create one more that's just simply purple. And we'll call this one done for the moment. There we go. Voila, there we go. Everything has its own material now, and life is good. Let's go back into our Arnold preview render and see what we got. And it's, yeah, that's starting to look pretty, pretty stellar. Pretty stellar. OK, cool. Now everything has its own material, okay? 
and uh, we're starting to separate everything out from that default Lambert one, and we're painting our scene with color, which I think is really a tremendous amount of fun. Um, we can only have, each polygon in our scene can only be influenced by a single material, okay? So I can't have, and let me show you what I'm talking about here, right? Notice I got my yellow stripes on my donut. If I go in and simply select these in here, I'll just do a couple of them, okay? How do you select them? So I'm doing what's called a loop selection. So I select the first one, hold down the shift key, and then double click, and it selects the loop. Good question. All right. All right, so I'm just going to do a couple. There it is. So check it out. They're all yellow now. If I was to return to the hypershade and, I don't know, let's drag the purple one on it, okay? See how they can only be influenced by singular material? Each polygon can only be assigned to one material. Now that doesn't mean that they can only be one color, because we can add new nodes into these materials that will allow us to create gradients of colors, or we can put texture maps on these, uh, on these polygons, but they're only ever, ever going to be influenced by one material. One material, okay? All right, so let's talk about how we're going to be editing these materials, because the surface characteristics that we were experimenting and exploring a second ago um, really helps our audience understand what types of shapes these are, okay, or what types of surfaces these are. So when I say surface qualities and uh, surface characteristics, I'm talking about how the light rays inside of our scene are bouncing off the surface and creating the illusion wood or metal or concrete or something like that, okay? Those are the surface characteristics. Uh, an easy way for me to wrap my brain around these surface characteristics is to kind of imagine that my, I'm like rubbing my hand across the surface of these objects and I'm asking myself as I do it, is it rough? Is it smooth? Is it smooth like, uh, you know, like a car? Is it rough like a piece of concrete? And the answers to those questions will help me figure out what characteristics I need to change to produce that illusion, okay? Now, Arnold makes it really, really, really easy to understand how all of these channels work together to create the illusions that we're after, okay? Let's just do it real fast, and I think I'm gonna start off by working with, uh, working with this blue guy over here. One other thing that's really important to point out is that the Ar Arnold render view is interactive, right? Now, hopefully you guys saw it, See how I click on these objects and they're highlighting for a second? As I do it, watch the attribute editor because it's going to change what it, depending on what I click on. So now here's the sphere. Now I got P, P sphere one. Here's cylinder and the cube itself. Okay? So if we're trying to drill down and edit the characteristics of the, uh, the material associated with the sphere, we don't necessarily have to return back to the hypershade, which can be an intimidating environment to make those edits. Just simply clicking on it in the Arnold render view will start to expose that object over here in the attribute editor and we can get to work. Okay? So the attribute editor is going to show you all the different nodes uh, that have been connected to this object that are responsible for its picture or for its creation, if you will, in the render itself. So psphere 1 and psphere, these, these are the input nodes that physically create the geometry. Well, we've made an association of, of a material to this object, which is called blue. So you're always going to see all the input connections for this object inside the attribute editor. So simply traveling over to blue, that's the material. And now we have all the attributes that are associated with this material. FYI, the hypershade on some materials and on some objects, they are not showing you all of the properties for that input node. Okay, um, on the Arnold surface shader, we're getting pretty much all the 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 the, the rock stars, the all stars. But on other on other things, you're getting a very truncated version of the the properties in the hypershade. What I like to encourage folks to do is work in the attribute editor, because the attribute editor is going to expose everything. Okay, it's the full kit and caboodle. Okay. So let's start going down and looking at how all of these characteristics of our material are going to influence our understanding of what type of surface this is. Okay? So let's start at the very top where it says weight. 
there. Weight and color okay, uh, have a direct relationship with each other. In every sense, the base okay, is like your car color. It's like the color of your shirt. It's the base color of this object. The weight is how much of that color. We choose the color in the color swatch below, but the weight value determines how much of that color is going to be applied to our object. Okay? Here's our blue sphere. Watch what happens when I start reducing the weight. See how it's getting darker and darker and darker? Okay? Now at a weight value of zero, we've basically turned off the diffuse amount for this material. Okay? Certain objects don't have color on them at all, right? They are completely reflective, like chrome. A lot of metals have their base values, excuse me, their base weight put down to zero because we want the complete, we want the, the metalness values to give it its color. More on that in a minute, okay? So the weight value is amount. And you're gonna see this, this weight channel in a lot of different sections here. See how we have transmission weight, specular weight, and base weight. Just think of this as amount, how much color. At a starting value of 0.8 for color, for the base color, this is a great starting point. So the defaults are quite wonderful for the base amount, okay, for the base weight, excuse me. I want to put this back to 0.8. Another way to think of this weight is in percentages. Maya kind of works in this zero to one you know, number space, where zero is zero percent, and one equals 100%. So really what we've done here is we've changed the weight, the base weight to 80%, okay, which is a good place to be. If you're at a 1.0 value of weight, you're often gonna start clipping the colors. It's gonna be super saturated. For this example, it's not that bad, but we're almost overdriving the color values in this area, and we're losing some detail along, along the surface of our, of our sphere. So, Honestly, I don't go above, you know, 8 or 8.5 you know, on most things. There has to be a damn good reason for me to, you know, push it up to 1 or even past 1 because you can overdrive these values, okay? Okay, um, so check this out. We're going we're gonna to skip roughness just for one second and, and kind of circle back and get it here in a second. But this metalness section is pretty rad, okay? Now, as I increase the metalness, what is, how are the surface properties of this object changing? They're getting more reflective. Yeah, and they're not actually getting more reflective, but how it's reflecting the colors inside of our scene is changing a little bit. If we were to reduce the weight all the way down to zero, okay, that's what it looks like. If we put it back to 0.8, now we have the beginnings of the illusion uh, of something similar to like an anodized aluminum, if you will, okay? So the metalness is gonna not necessarily influence the reflection, because if you look at the reflectivity of our object, it's actually still the same, but it's having a direct influence on the color, okay? Huh? Is it the color? So it's basically just the color makes it a bit... Yeah, it's... Sharp, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's fair. Yeah, I think that's fair. But really, let's put the, the metalness back down to zero. But really, we want to spend the most time on our specular reflection. Now, right now, I don't think we're going to get, yeah, okay. Right now, the specular weight, the specular amount, is determining the reflectivity of our object, okay? At a value of 1.0, you can see what we get. We have a nice little, you know, shiny sphere, okay? Almost perfectly reflective. The color is going to tint. Let's see if we can make it off, yeah. Now we're tinting those reflections, okay? Kind of fun in the color section. The roughness is, has probably the biggest impact on our understanding uh, of, the, of the surface characteristics of this object. So I want you to watch what happens to the reflections on my sphere when I start changing the roughness values, okay? At a value of 0.1, look very carefully at what I have. Now watch what happens when I turn this off to zero. Look over here. It may be difficult to see on the projector on my screen. All the reflections turned crisp and clear and absolutely perfect. Okay, With the roughness value slider being way driven up, watch what happens now. Our reflections are starting to blur. You guys see that? 
It's not as crisp and defined, defined anymore, and it has everything to do with the roughness. Now, my imagination, the roughness value is probably the biggest, the biggest driver on our understanding of what type of material this is or what type of surface this is, right? Now, let's just pretend here for a second, okay? Because the roughness value makes sense when we start comparing it to some really weird things, okay? Let's pretend for a second that we have, um, we've broken into Fort Knox, right? You guys know Fort Knox? Yeah, yeah Fort Knox, man, right? What's Fort Knox? It's the most heavily armed and guarded military installation probably on the planet, right? Because what's at the center of Fort Knox? All of our gold, not all of it, but a good portion of, our, of the U.S. gold reserve is in Fort Knox, right? Do you guys know that one of the major factors of uh, the value of our currency is that that piece of paper is associated with a certain percentage of an actual gold block, which is awesome, right? I just love to think that a dollar bill is equal to some crazy percentage of a gigantic gold block. And we have a mountain of gold blocks sitting in Tennessee in Fort Knox, right? Nope. Or is it Kentucky? I can't remember what I thought in my head. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the, you know, there's a reason uh, that the Army has placed a gigantic military base around Fort Knox, right? The mechanized infantry uh, is stationed at Fort Knox. It's one of the biggest military, biggest Army bases in the nation, right? Because it's guarding very specifically our gold reserve, right? So let's pretend that we are super ninjas, right? We've broken our way into Fort Knox. We've battled the army. We have uh, emerged victorious, and we've just like kicked down the door to Fort Knox, and we're standing literally in a, an endless room of gold. And then there's like an alien over there too, right? Because I'm convinced that there's an alien in there, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's Smog the Dragon in Fort Knox, and we now have a new enemy to defeat, right? Uh, so imagine that you're, you're standing in front of you know, all this you know, gigantic pile of gold, and you pick up a gold block, right? And you're holding it in your hand, okay? Now run your hand across the surface of that gold bar. How does it feel? Very smooth, right? With smooth objects like metal, okay? The light rays are going to bounce off the surface very, very quickly. They're going to reflect almost immediately, okay? And this is how I like to pretend and think about it. So if we're looking at a cross-section of a gold bar, okay, so we're looking at our gold bar from the side, on a smooth object, like a piece of metal or a piece of glass, right, the angle of incident, or excuse me, the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence, okay? So if the light ray comes down this way, and there's nothing to interact with that light ray, it's going to hit the surface, then reflect back out into my environment almost immediately, okay? Almost immediately, and this is the result that we get. Or let me turn my roughness down, okay? When we have almost instantaneous reflections, as we have here, you can see, hopefully you can see, and I'll turn up my metalness to really overdrive it. Check it out, see how the reflections are very, very crisp and defined? Okay, that has everything to do with how the light rays are bouncing off the surfaces. Okay, however, if there was uh, like a piece of concrete, right? If we were to do the exact same thing with a piece of concrete, the surface, oh my eraser, there's my eraser. The surface would look completely different, right? Instead of being a com completely flat line at the top, on a piece of concrete, the cross section would look like this, right? It'd just be all over the place, okay? Same light ray coming down from the exact same angle here. This time, it's going to hit maybe a bump or a groove, a little gouge, a pit. But it's not going to reflect back in the exact immediately. Maybe that light ray, because of the angle of this little bit here, goes this way, and then it hits this thing, and then eventually, it reflects back out into the scene itself. When the light ray is hanging around on the surface, the specular values of that object kind of get diffused. It gets spread it out. Okay, because the light ray is dancing around on the surface for a bit before it reflects back out into the scene. Okay, we achieve this by increasing the roughness. So in my imagination, whenever I'm changing the roughness, I go smooth, bumpy. Okay, it's either a really smooth surface like a piece of glass, or by increasing the roughness, I've made, I've started to create the illusion that this is a bumpy surface. Okay. A surface that's a little bit more matte, if you will, than, than, uh, than reflective, okay? Everything in our universe is reflective, okay? 
just at varying degrees. Yeah, that's how we can see it. Your faces are reflective. You guys are reflective beings on Valentine's Day. How do I know that you're reflective beings? We are always deep in thought, but I can see the light bouncing off the surface of your skin, right? You know, I'm looking over here at Cody, and I can see the light rays from the computer monster bouncing off his skin and reflecting back into our environment. We are reflective. Everything in the world is reflective, just at varying degrees, okay? Something like metal, very reflective. Human skin, kind of reflective. A piece of wood, kind of reflective, right? Glass, very reflective. And everything in between. A coffee cup, reflective, okay? Everything is reflective, just in varying degrees. The roughness helps us start creating that illusion. Metal, human skin, okay? So the specular amount and all the specularity properties are the most important in describing the type of surface that we're working with here, okay? All right. So this is where I spend a majority of my time dialing in these values. This is the beginning of our audience understanding what in the hell this thing is. Okay. All right. One final thing about specularity. I'll put the roughness back down. Um, right now we have this wonderful physical, uh, this wonderful sky dome in our background. Uh, we don't actually have a direct illuminator like an area light instead of our scene. I want to show you real fast how this idea of specularity changes when we insert just a simple area light. And uh, let, me, let me just move this around a little bit. Let's do this. Pull it up. All right. And with this light selected, I'm also going to increase its intensity quite a bit. All right, now we can see the role of specularity a little bit more directly. And I apologize, the numbers or the image is getting a little bit, a little bit crunched on the projector. Let me see if I can fix that real fast. Okay. Um, yeah, now that's a little bit easier to see. Because now we can actually see a true specular highlight and a specular reflection of the light source in our scene, okay? That's what this thing is down over here, okay? This is that area light that I just added in. It's being reflected as a light source inside of my scene. Once again, if I return to my material characteristics and look at the specular amount or the specular weight, you can kind of get a really great understanding of that weight when there's a, when there's a light in the scene, okay? Because now we're determining how much is this object reflective? Is it like reflected like a chrome ball? Or is it not as chromey but still a little bit reflective? So we get to determine the weight, the amount of reflectivity using the weight value here. Okay? With it almost off, you know, I can still just, can you guys see that? I just barely see the highlight in there. And then if we were to drive it up, phew, very reflective and pretty obvious. Okay? Specular highlight is the most important part of our entire, entire thing here, okay? Now the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go over here into my purple cone because I want to start talking about the transmission. The transmission weight is really transparency, okay? With a weight of zero, opaque, I'm working with the purple cone here now. Now watch what happens when I increase the transparency. No, the transmission, excuse me, now we've made it transparent. Okay, it looks like it's all black at the moment, well, because it is all black, okay? Let's see if we can find a good angle that showcases that, yep, there it is. Showcases that it is, in fact, transparent. We can see through the object into the, uh, into the cube behind it. Now, we are also battling against some other parts, the depth values here. This determines how far the ray goes into the inside, and it takes some experimentation to get the depth right. But the transmission section is really where you're going to you're going to be start dialing in your transparency uh, values, and it takes some work to kind of get the the weight, the color, the depth, uh, all working together to get the illusion that you're after. Okay. All right. 
last but certainly not least, let's, uh, let's do this. I'm actually going to take a step back for a second, and I'm going to delete my Sky Dome and my area light. Oops, before I did that, let me click on my blue sphere. I did. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Because I can do the exact same thing right there. All right. So lastly, lastly uh, is emission. We're going to talk about subsurface later. Subsurface scattering is a really advanced material characteristic. Simply, subsurface scattering defines how light bounces around on the inside of our objects. Um, I'm not wearing my hat today, but if I was backlit, you know, if, you, if, you, if I held a candle up behind my ear, right, you'd be able to, my, my ear would become semi-transparent. And the color of my ear would change because the light rays, the lights are going through that thin piece of skin here. It's bouncing around on the inside before it reflects back out of the scene. Okay? It's a pretty advanced idea. It requires a lot of tweaking and some extra materials and textures to kind of you know, get it working correctly. But uh, it allows us to create some really advanced effects. That's all a hand. Taylor, do you have a question? Yeah. But the one that I want to talk about is emission. Emission is kind of fun. Emission allows us to turn our objects into lights. It's one of the ways that we can turn our objects into lights. Right now, the emission value is set to zero, but as dun, 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 I put it up as one, now that sphere is turning into a, an indirect illuminator, an indirect light source inside of my scene. And you can see that it's starting to kind of glow a little bit. Okay, this is the first step into creating glowing objects in our 3D renders. It's the first step, not the final step. It actually takes a little bit more energy to make it work, but we can turn our meshes into light sources through that emission value. Of course, the color will allow us to change it too. Maybe I want my sphere to be blue, be a blue light just as it is. Okay. And now it's a blue light instead of our scene. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? That's for the emission section. Let's turn our lights back on. Put my sky dome back in, and we're on our way. Cool, huh? Cool. So the materials are step numero uno in helping us establish uh, the surface characteristics of our objects. I want us to take a little break here, and then we're going to come in and start talking about textures. Because I want to start placing some images into my, into my shading networks to create maybe the illusion of some ground or maybe put a background in there that makes a little bit more sense than just a solid color. So back in 10 minutes, please.
Okie dokie, let's get back to it. So uh, we were messing around with the basic surface characteristics of our materials, but we need to start layering in some new details, okay? Specifically, what's called a texture map. A texture map allows us to very quickly reproduce the photorealistic qualities of a photograph, right? Because it, it basically is a photograph. The fastest way to make the, the ground plane of our environment here look like wood is to put a picture of some wood down on the ground plane, right? FYI, this is not cheating. <laughs> a lot of people think that we have to like build it from scratch and that's how we earn our union card. No, everyone uses textures. It's kind of the, it's kind of the foundation for our entire, entire image creation system in the computer. We want to use photographs, texture maps to polygons. It's the fastest way to get the realism that we're after, right? So um, I've gone ahead and downloaded a texture. Okay, and let me show you what I have here. I downloaded a couple of them actually. I went on to the web and I'll show you where I went and I downloaded this thing. Okay, this is literally just a photograph of someone's flo uh, floor, right? There's nothing magical about it. It is a JPEG like any other JPEG. It's a photograph, the same type of photograph that you would create with your phone. Okay, there's nothing magical about this. And I downloaded this from one of my favorite online texture resources. Let me show you. It's pretty great. You're going to love it. They don't give me any money, but perhaps they should give me some money. It's a website called textures.com. Okay? Textures.com is an online library of photographs and additional texturing resources. Okay? There's a lot of stuff on here. I really, really, really encourage you to start checking this out. This is how we achieve photorealism in computer graphics. It's more than just kind of messing around with some sliders in the attribute editor. We need to start appending our surfaces with these really great images to get the results that we're after. Okay? Uh, when you get more comfortable working with textures and creating UV maps, then we'll start making our own. Okay? And we're going to be using an app called Substance Painter in GCOM 424. And that's all we do in Substance Painter is physically make and paint our own textures. Right? Um, when you get into the high end of things, and I'm not doing this to show off, but it's just a real great visual example. Um, when you start working on um, real kind of direct photorealism, okay, here's a great example. Okay, this is something I made for GCOM 424 a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Okay, this is more than just a photograph kind of blanketed onto my treasure chest, right? I went in and I started customizing my textures and I created a whole series of textures to put detail where I wanted it to go, right? Um, and that's called texture painting. But at the core of all of this, is nothing more than a whole series of images, okay? A whole series of pictures that have been placed on the model itself. Let me show you. There's the actual model, okay? It's all an illusion, right? It's all just a trick. And here's the actual polygonal cage for the surface itself, okay? And then with all the textures back on, we're getting the illusion that we're after, okay? So we want to use images. They're part of our process. So don't feel embarrassed about that. Was weird. Don't feel embarrassed about using textures from textures.com. Everyone uses textures from texture.com. I've been coming back to this one resource for a long, long time. Um, they are going to ask you to create a user account. It's free. You don't have to pay for this, right? If you choose to throw them some cash, you get the some extra features on it. But let's just like for example, I'm down here at the bottom of their main page. Uh, they have everything nicely categorized. And let's, there's also a search, which I find really helpful. But let's just go down into, oh, I don't know. Let's do floors. OK. Boom. Check it out. All, look at all this stuff, right? Here's rounded, messy floors. OK. An error occurred on my live stream. So hopefully, OK. I apologize if the live stream broke. We're back. OK. Um, OK. So I don't want my ground plane to be this, this weird teal color. I want it to be that picture. OK. I want to texture map uh, that image onto my ground plane. Now, the way that we do this is through the material. So I want to return to the, to the material itself. And pop quiz, uh, you know, the base color is what determines the color of everything. Here's the, the, channel, the channel swap that allows us to swap the color. But have you ever wondered what these little checkerboard icons allow us to do? These checkerboard icons allow us, in every sense, to assign 
uh, an input node okay, to this channel. Instead of me determining the color of this, I want that image to determine the color of this material. So we start by clicking on that little checkerboard object to assign an input node to that object. Okay? And then over here, you're going to say create node, or you're going to see this thing that says create node. Now specifically, we need to go, so it's going to automatically highlight all the, ch all the categories that have input nodes that are available to us. And we want to choose the file node, because we want to use a file to overwrite the color channel. Hold on a sec. Let me open up good old Hypershade. Did it do it? Oh, yeah, it did it. Sorry. It did it. I just looked at the wrong area first. So the moment you hit that file button, your attribute editor is going to change. Okay? And we should see a new, a new node, this place 2D texture, the file node itself. This is what's responsible for putting the image on, on the polygon itself. So the image name, this is where we need to direct the computer to where the image is currently located. Mine's just sitting on the desktop. And voila, it's done. Now on the surface, you're probably saying, Pat, I don't see an image on there. Let's open up pre a render preview. There it is. One other thing, this is actually kind of helpful. Okay? So now we have my wood floor inside of my scene. Check this out. This is kind of neat. If I wanted to see my texture in the viewport, there's some viewport properties that we can adjust to get what we're after. Okay? Oops. It's the number six key on your top row number pad. That's going to change your viewport shading properties to show the textures that are applied to your objects. Okay? In addition, you can also do the exact same thing up here. This is wireframe, soft shade, uh, default materials. This is Lambert 1, basically. This one's textures. See how it turns it on and off. You can actually, actually preview the lighting too, which is pretty neat. How do you feel the timing on it? Yeah. So let's talk about. <clears throat> excuse me. Let's talk about actually what we've done here, right? Because it seems magical, but it's actually not magical at all. Let's return to the hypershade and start exploring physically what's changed uh, on our lovely ground material. So up until now, we've been working inside of our browser, our create menu, and then of course this section over here. Uh, and our property editor to, editor to change all of our surface characteristics. But now we need to start working in the workspaces to understand the network okay, of nodes that are responsible for shading our ground. So check it out. Uh, down here in our workspace, our graph workspace, okay, we have a whole series of icons. This first one with the stars on it, it's going to clear our workspace graph. It's not going to delete anything. okay. A lot of people, they freak out. They go, did I just delete all my nodes that are responsible for my materials? No. Okay? You're just clearing the graph. You're not deleting anything. You're just clearing it out. So now we have a nice empty workspace here. And I'm going to click on my ground material. These options will load the, the material into the graph. And specifically, we want this middle one because it's, it's automatically going to graph all the input and output connections of the selected material. And if you're following along, check it out. Let's just do it real fast. Dun, da, da, da. Let's make it a little bit smaller so you guys can see what's going on. All right, so check it out. There's actually a whole series of nodes that are responsible for placing this image on the material itself. This first one, this is the actual material characteristics that we've been messing with over here. If you look at the long list of uh, options that we have available to us, it almost matches channel for channel what we're used to seeing in the property inspector. But now that we're trying to add a texture into the mix and load an image into the color values of our material, we need to start examining the role of these other two. Okay? Because these I think of these things as packets of information that all have a singular focus and a function inside of the of the graph itself. Okay? The place 2D texture node this determines how the image is going to be placed on the object itself. This contains all the attributes that we need to change the tiling, the rotation, the position. We'll, we'll, we'll mess with some of this a little bit later. Okay? So this is the how the image is placed on the object. And then this is what is placed on the object. This is the file node. This is a physical, direct, explicit link to the current location of the image that we're putting on the ground. Okay? 
in Maya, everything is separated out. So we can easily, easily start to uh, find that specific chunk of information that changes, uh, you know, the, that allows us to make the change that we're here to make, okay? So with this thing selected, check it out. Again, here's the explicit location to the object that we're working with, okay? It also allows us to change a number of the color parameters associated with the image itself. Uh, the place 2D texture node, this is how it's going to be placed on, on the object itself. More on this here in a minute. Okay? And then all of that information is piped into the color channels. So if you follow the stream of information, it starts here. Its information is sent to the texture node, the, the file node, excuse me. And the color, in, the color channels of the file node are then piped in to the color values of our material. Okay? which then all of that information gets sent to the actual shader itself, okay? which is what we see um, in the actual render, or what the computer, what the renderer engine needs uh, in order for, uh, for these materials to be drawn correctly. Okay? So welcome to node-based material characteristics and editing. It's, it's going to be a little bit of a challenging workspace for us as we continue to go forward, but let's see what we get. Okay? That's pretty cool. Pretty neat, huh? Pretty neat. So I think it was Taylor that asked, how can I change the tiling of all of this? Well, let's go back into the graph, the hypershade. Here's the place 2D texture, and I believe, repeat, let's put this to 2 and 2. Yep, now it's smaller. We're adjusting the size. The place 2D texture node doesn't give us a tremendous amount of control. But if we put it to like five by five, yeah. Now it's stamping down. It's repeating that exact same image five times inside. Actually, it's doing it 25 times, in all honesty, inside the exact same space. If it's at one, then we just see it once. OK? Cool, huh? Pretty cool. So images are, are really easy to add into our, um, our graphs. As a reminder, it all begins with the color values. Okay. So if we go to blue, and you can even do this over here too. These little checkerboards, and they're all over the place, right? Which is pretty cool because we now can make an association with these channels to other nodes inside of our graph itself. Okay. It's going to allow us to create the file node. Okay, this is the one because we, we want to import an external file into our hypergraph to get what we're after. Okay, and then we got to tell it which file to use. Okay, and I don't, let's put Joe Pesci. Why not? <laughs> there he is. Uh, use the JPEG. The .tx, the text files, is something that's going to be created by, by Maya itself. Okay. Okay. There's Joe Pesci just chilling on my sphere, right? Right? Not at all creepy. Not at all creepy. Not at all creepy. And how much does, like, the file size influence how mm -hmm. good it looks? Is it just resolution and whatnot? It so does. It influences it, yeah. So generally bigger is better? I'd say we have to make sure that we're we're choosing the appropriate resolution for what we're mapping it to. If it is uh, huge in the frame, a higher resolution image is what we need. If I'm putting an image on my little cone down there, I can get away with a 512 by 512 texture because it's not that big inside the frame. Yeah, but like maybe the flooring, the background, you kind of want to get that as high as possible because that's kind of, or how would you do it? Yeah, like I said, you, you got to think about the role of the polygon inside of the frame yeah. itself, right? If the polygon is huge and it dominates the entire frame, then you're going to want a higher texture map so you don't see all the jagged edges of the lower quality image. So it's, there's not a, you got to look at what you're doing and how big the image is in relationship to. So generally to. the larger the file size, the crisper the image? No. No? Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> not the file size, but like larger the image size doesn't necessarily make it. Oh, so you're talking about resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah, yes, right. Yeah. Higher resolution pi pictures are always going to give you pretty crisp result results, okay. but it could be a waste of your resources. Well, yeah. 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 
OK, so let's talk for a second about how we can extend this entire, this entire system, system of images to our background, right? Because right now, we're working with this cool sky dome. OK, mine's just kind of this really gray default color. OK, let's make it something fun like, I don't know, red. Woo! Now everything's red inside the scene, right? But to get really good results, often we don't want to rely upon a singular color in our background to tint and to help light our scenes. We want to use images, right? This is called HDR lighting, high dynamic range lighting. We want to put pictures in the background of our, of our sky domes, and then the colors in the picture are going to help tint and light our scene appropriately. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I've downloaded some environment maps, okay? Yeah. Excuse me. All right. Um, and this is what it looks like. This is a 360 degree spherical image, I think from China. Okay, um, and we're going to basically wallpaper the inside of our sky dome with this image. It's going to wrap around the inside of a sphere. In order to do what we're about to do, we need to have spherical images, right? If you just try to take like a flat image like uh, our wood plank that we're using for our ground and wrap it around the inside of our sphere, the image is going to get stretched and distorted and it's not going to look re real and it's going to look pretty poor. So we want to make sure that we're using reflection maps or spherical maps. I got this from a really great resource that I like to share with folks. I should, they should, you know, again, they should throw me some money because I think it's really great. It's called HDRI Haven. Um, I really would recommend that you throw some cash at these folks, okay? Donate, give them, a, you know, give them $5 or so, Let them buy, them, buy them a cup of coffee because they're providing a lot of these really great reflection maps and spherical maps for us for free, basically, right? You don't have to pay anything. It's a pay, uh, you know, what you want kind of environment. There's a lot of really great stuff in here, and I can't recommend it enough, right? So if you go into the HDRI section, you know, they have it all categorized, okay? And just start exploring it. There's some really, really, really good stuff in here. Um, you can get some huge files, okay? Uh, let's just pick this grassy knoll one, okay? So down here, this is where you download it. Check it out. They actually have a 16K image available for you guys, and it's 349 megabytes. I would really recommend that you don't download that one for what we're doing, okay? You don't need that resolution on your images unless you're rendering something at 4K for a cinema screen. For our little projects, the 1 or 2K files are just going to be fine, okay? I've already downloaded one. Like I said, it's that one right there, and I want to put this in the background of my physical, uh, or excuse me, of my skylight. Let's run back in. Now, uh, I need to select my sky dome, and of course, in our attribute editor, what am I going to choose? How do I start importing that image into the background of my scene? Yeah, the checkerboard icon, so we can add an input node to that channel. Over here in the Create Render node, little popover. What's next? File. Yeah, file. You got lucky. My mouse cursor just happened to rest on it. File. And then over in the Attribute Editor, we'll need to load in the image we want to place in the background. And I'm just going to navigate to my desktop and choose that HDRI. Boink. There it is. OK. Now let's open up our render view and see how it changes. Because now things are 